Welcome back. I hope you got a little something to eat because you're not getting anything until we finish this session. But then there'll be lunch. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Alan Leshner. I'm uh, from AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Science Magazine. And I very much appreciate the advertising that we heard earlier this morning. And I hope that throughout the rest of the day, people will refer to their papers in Science Magazine and forget talking about that other one. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that when, when we were in Engedi uh, the last few days, there were way too many mentions of nature and not enough of science. Um, so I, uh, I want to take just one minute before we start the session, but I, I am going to say that unusually we are going to actually stay on time for this session. I, I know it's a violating an ancient tradition, but there's another tradition that says never get in between people and lunch. And therefore, to preserve that one, we're going to try to stay on time during this session. But I'm going to take about five minutes and just tell you about a study. I have no slides. Um, that I recently chaired for the US National Academy of Sciences on the prevention of uh, dementia, age-related cognitive decline, and Alzheimer's-like dementia in particular. And uh, it was brought about, of course, because of the fact that in addition to dying, the biggest concern people have as they approach a, a old age is that they'll develop uh, cognitive impairment and dementia. And the US National Institute on Aging, the one and a half billion dollar uh, Institute of the National Institutes of Health that's devoted to uh, disorders of aging and what to do about them, asked the National Academy of Sciences to help them in informing the public in a science-based way about what do we know and what do we not know about the ability to prevent cognitive decline. And they did it in a very unusual way. They, so the US National Academy of Sciences does you know, hundreds of studies a year. But this particular study, as dictated by the National Institute of Health, had the intention of informing public health messages what would you say to the public if you were the most important, the only really, major source of funding in the United States for research on ending, on aging? What science-based message would you put out? And so they asked us to, to do that study. And it began with what's called an evidence-based review, a formal review of the scientific literature based only on formal clinical trials. OK, so this is the highest standard that you can apply. And I will confess that our committee did go a little bit broader and look at some observational and correlational data. And the bottom line of what came out of it was basically, don't get your hopes up. Uh, there is nothing that is conclusively been shown to to have the ability to, to pre prevent dementia in spite of the advertisements for nutritional supplements and brain games and things like that. But there are three things that had encouraging but inconclusive evidence. One is the management of blood pressure, particularly in middle life. Now, that's a do no harm intervention, because controlling your blood pressure is good for you anyway and prevents stroke. Stroke is the largest cause of uh, dementia. Uh, so control your blood pressure, physical activity. And there are some cognitive exercises that look like they might have effects. None of them are those computer-based brain games that, in fact, get advertised all the time. Those have actually never been subjected to clinical trials, as is true with all of the nutraceuticals, all the other kinds of things. So the answer to the question, what can I do, is simply put, 
uh, take care of yourself, do the things that are good for you, control your blood pressure, maintain physical activity, and maintain cognitive activity, uh, and there ain't no guarantee that it will do something, but at a minimum, those three things won't hurt you. Okay, with that, uh, this session is uh, going to be very interesting, I think. We're going to start with Professor Dov Sh uh, Schmutkin, who is uh, from here, uh, from Tel, Tel Aviv University. And uh, I won't, his biography is in your uh, program, and I won't go through that. Uh, so with no further ado, please, Dr. Schmutkin. Uh, thank you very much for the opening remarks. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to speak in this wonderful gathering. And uh, I would like uh, uh, to share with you uh, uh, ideas, uh, studies, uh, about psychological trauma in old age. Well, uh, a, good, uh, a good starting point would be to look at the definition of psychological trauma in the nosological psychiatry, uh, mainly or namely the DSM, a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Diseases, uh, edition five. Uh, uh, this um, nosology, psychiatric nosology, uh, defines uh, the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, initially established in the DSM-3 in uh, 1980. Um, and in order to define PTSD, it must define what a traumatic event is. Uh, this is the definition of a traumatic event one that a person was exposed to, death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened sexual violence. It was added in DSM-5. It wasn't there before. Uh, this definition is quite narrow because all of us know about certain events which may be severely traumatic and do, are not included in this definition. Bereavement, for example, um, uh, abuse all along life, a very uh, extreme economic deprivation, caregiving to a disabled family member for a long time. All those are not included, so, um, we may consult also the, the, the ICD-10, the competing nosology of the, the International Classification of Diseases uh, issued by the World Health Organization. The former DSM is established and issued by the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, well, I, I added here the DSM-4 because it had and a, a, a different definition. The, different, the definitions are changing, they are fluid, which means that, the def, that we, we don't really know how to define trauma, I mean, uh, uh, conclusively. So in order uh, to uh, study uh, what trauma is about, uh, well, uh, we would like to know that the very existence of the entity called post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is still controversial. Just imagine what lived on a very famous researcher of uh, trauma. What he said, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a normal adapt adaptive process of reaction to an abnormal situation. Well, uh, this is the, a, a, a very short 
list, very short list, of possible traumas, or more accurately, potentially traumatic events. <coughs> Uh, these uh, include also events that are not, as I said, included in the formal uh, DSM, in the formal psychiatric nosology. Well, uh, prevalence of trauma was studied by uh, several, by, by a lot of uh, researchers. These are the classical ones and uh, they differ in the proportion, in the prevalence of uh, trauma in, uh, in a person's life uh, because they differed in definition of trauma, they differed in the measures uh, of, uh, of trauma, but nevertheless, we can say that they all concluded that the majority, even the vast majority of the population uh, experience some trau major traumatic events along life. Well, in Israel, uh, we, uh, I uh, took advantage of the national survey conducted as a branch of the SHARE, SHARE is the all European survey uh, of older population. Uh, it is uh, conducted in, um, practically in all over Europe. Israel is a member there. And uh, in the first wave uh, of share in Israel, uh, I was one who introduced a survey of trauma or traumatic events. Uh, and uh, you see there in the results that most of the people have in life between one to three traumatic events, or just to say in due caution, potentially traumatic events. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, weird that even one quarter decline to report any traumatic event. We can discuss why it's not, uh, we, we don't have time right now, but nevertheless, uh, these are the examples that we uh, uh, studied, uh, you see that the most prevalent uh, events are uh, having uh, had a loved one at risk of death due to illness or accident, uh, having provided long-term care to a disabled or impaired relative, having experienced extremely severe economic deprivation, and lost a loved one in a war or in a military service, which is characteristics of the uh, Israeli context. Well, uh, we prefer to study uh, this survey uh, in terms of cumulative adversity, because we wondered whether the accumulation uh, of uh, traumatic events along life uh, whether this uh, accumulation has a definite impact on the mental health, even the physical health of older people. I just remind you that the SHARE study um, is designed uh, uh, to assess uh, physical and mental health of people over the age 50, I mean in late, later life. Well, uh, just uh, to make it short, uh, you see it's, it's quite expected that as long as, long as uh, people age, they, they, they have more traumatic events, of course. Uh, you see that men are more exposed to traumatic events, yet women react, women react more severely to traumatic events, and that's why the rate of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is higher among women than among men. Uh, you see that there is a close relation between the number of traumatic events and the uh, health status. Uh, having a lower health status means having uh, more uh, traumatic events. That's natural. So, uh, 
at the end, we studied the possible uh, situation whereby cumulative adversity, I mean the sheer number of traumatic events, has an effect, for example, on, on depression. And when we adjust for practically all the major social demographic variables, including self-rated health, still after all these adjustments, we get a significant effect whereby number of adverse events in life affects the uh, level of depression, depressive symptoms, actually, uh, in old life. Uh, well, uh, these, this is the list that we, that, we, that we had in the survey. We separated it even to um, other-oriented uh, adversity or self-oriented adversity. I mean, self-oriented adversity means that the main infliction is upon the self, the respondent, him or herself. Whereas other oriented uh, adversity means that the major infliction is upon somebody else. It may be a close relative, such as in the bereavement, uh, losing a spouse, for example, it is still other oriented uh, adversity, whereas uh, one that was uh, that uh, was wounded in war or military action is uh, uh, an example of self-oriented uh, adversity. Well, these two kinds of adversity behave differently in their effects. <clears throat> uh, self-oriented adversity is harmful to mental health. It results, after all adjustments, in higher depression, for example. Whereas other oriented adversity practically ha has no correlation with depression or even, just, just, just have a look, even a negative correlation. Which means that when we are speaking about traumatic events in a long life, the ones that inflict uh, the, the ones that inflict us as uh, as the primary focus of the event uh, uh, are really uh, harmful for us, for our mental health, for very long time, up to old age, even. Whereas other oriented adversity requires sometimes that we cope with the situation much better, that we overcome even the trauma because it's other-oriented uh, adversity, which means that we have to take charge, that we have to, to be uh, 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 responsible for the ones who were inflicted. It means that uh, we have a certain responsibility to share, mainly in emergency, where those events occurred, and so on. So uh, this is important to note, but let us address the main question here. It was an Israeli survey. Is the, is the older Israeli population really traumatized or more traumatized than in other countries uh, in old age? Well. Uh, don't be astonished to hear the answer. Yes. Okay. Um, for example, uh, there are certain statistics made by distinct studies about the prevalence, for example, of PTSD in Israel and abroad, in Europe, in the States. Uh, the rates in Israel you are used to be higher uh, for example, uh, some between 9 to 10 percent of the population is currently diagnosed or may be currently diagnosed uh, with uh, PTSD, whereas in Europe it's not more than 2 up to 4 percent. In the States even, it's 8 percent. So we can also infer about the mental health 
uh, related to trauma uh, by the prevalence of uh, clinical depression. The measures that we use, we use two measures of depression, very widespread, and uh, both of them have a clinical threshold <coughs> recognized in many studies abroad uh, beyond which uh, respondents may be declared as uh, potentially uh, uh, depressed or depressive in the clinical sense, okay? Well, in Israel, 35% are over the clinical threshold of, depend of depression. Can you imagine that? Yes, you can imagine that. Well, in the highest in Europe, Spain and Italy and France are similar. We wondered whether it is the Mediterranean. We were talking about the Mediterranean diet. Well, the Mediterranean means more emotionality. More emotionality means more depression even. So perhaps that's the answer. And in uh, the rest of Europe, uh, you see there are happy countries. I mean, uh, the rate of depression is not beyond, is not beyond 20%. So Israel is among the highest. Uh, I had another uh, national survey which I studied, uh, in which I studied, it was a national survey of Israelis beyond the age 75. Well, uh, just uh, a few examples from uh, this survey, Holocaust survivors, uh, 32 of percent of them were beyond the clinical threshold. A control group of post-World War II immigrants from Europe, not defined as Holocaust survivor, 40 percent. That's something to say about the effects of the Holocaust, the direct and indirect effects of the Holocaust. I will talk about it a bit later. And then a control group of pre-World War II immigrants from Europe was just 21%. So this is uh, the older population in Israel uh, suffers from higher rates of, of trauma and depression. Well, uh, if we are talking about the Israeli older population, we cannot avoid mentioning the major trauma which is in the background of a large portion of this uh, population, the Holocaust trauma. Well, uh, I, had, I conducted a series of studies about Holocaust survivors along the years, and uh, some of them from national surveys, and uh, I got into the conclusion that most of the uh, uh, community samples of Holocaust survivors in Israel, not the clinical samples, the community samples, quite a difference. Well, most of them have the two characteristic, kind of dialectic characteristics. They have a general resilience. Most of them managed to live normal life managed to wear a family, children, managed to lead a career and great achievements, most of them, and still most of them have specific vulnerabilities, sometimes hidden. I mean, not socially visible, but still uh, they have it, and this is, uh, and these vulnerabilities may be a parent may be more salient in older age. So there are certain studies that suggest that Holocaust survivors coming <coughs> into old age may have higher, may be reactivated by the trauma, so to say. I mean, old age may raise <coughs> vulnerabilities that initiated in the Holocaust trauma were somehow dormant through the years and then come up in old age. 
Well, just uh, to show one example, uh, Holocaust survivors uh, have a, well, we can say Holocaust survivors, we check not only traumatic events before the Holocaust, but also traumatic events, but also traumatic events after the Holocaust, I mean after 1945. And just see, you can see, that among the uh, non-survivors, the relation between these post-Holocaust events and contact with doctor, kind of a marker uh, for health, okay, is very positive. Among Holocaust survivors, the relation is between these post-Holocaust events, traumatic events, and depression. I mean, this is their vulnerability in, in comparison to the non-survivors. Well, we see the Holocaust survivors in, in current studies, and we ask ourselves, about their trauma. Is their trauma a matter of the past? Or is it still vivid? Is it still viable? What is the time context of this trauma? Well, uh, these older people, older men, show the numbers of Auschwitz and uh, they are old now. I mean, they survived some decades ago, but still they show the numbers. The trauma is there. So uh, I will tell you about just two major mechanisms, psychological mechanisms, by which survivors can regulate, can ameliorate their a trauma. The first one is forming an adaptive and efficient time perspective about their life. Uh, uh, I had a study where uh, we uh, examined uh, Holocaust survivors who were uh, patients in ambulatory treatment. Uh, you see, uh, we uh, studied uh, about the expre their expressions about their trauma in the Holocaust, and we saw by factor analysis that we, there are two different factors there. Expressions which say to us, the trauma, our trauma, our Holocaust trauma is really past. We called it Holocaust as past. We are trying to overcome the, 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 the remnants of this trauma. I mean, the, the reminders of this trauma, but it's past. In others, the trauma is present. I mean, they feel the, the Holocaust is continuing, actually. They uh, are preparing for another Holocaust. Well, uh, we divided uh, these two modes of Holocaust as past and Holocaust as present and tried to find out <coughs> the psychological mechanisms that are in between. Just separating between those who are trying to repress the trauma or even to encapsulate it in a safe manner, whereas Others are dwelling on the trauma. I mean, the trauma is an everyday experience. Well, a time, uh, I'm talking about time perspective. Time perspective means also having a certain <coughs> perceived trajectory of life. I mean, what kind of life did I have? Was it an ascending life? of gaining more and more satisfaction and fulfillment? Is it a descending life, more and more losses and decline? And there are so many other varieties of trajectory. This is also a kind of time perspective, a major psychological uh, a mechanism. 
Another mechanism is the generation of meaning, deriving meanings about life and about the life story. One's life story is actually the, the, the very essence of one's meaning in life. So uh, what, we be, what we saw here, that Holocaust survivors who could not form a, a rational, um, a, a proportional life story, but rather con had a condensation of the events in life in an overlapping manner, mainly centered around the period of their trauma, the Holocaust time, when those survivors uh, had, uh, you see, the high condensation, had lower positive affect in their life. Whereas, whereas, survivors who had high density of a life story. I mean, again, too many events concentrating in one, uh, in, in, in a long, a certain period. The disability to spread the life story over the years. These survivors had higher suffering. So, the ability to incorporate the, me the traumatic memory into the present is a major uh, issue of surviving the trauma in old age. And li the life story must represent something positive, something that can be transmitted into, into the second generation, into one's uh, meaning and essence of life. Well, uh, we can divide uh, the ability to cope with past trauma into three kinds of aging. The first is robust aging. We would like to have it all. I mean, the ability to withstand decline, to withstand uh, uh, the vulnerability of old age and to gain resilience that uh, uh, enable us uh, to be robust even in, even in old age. The second one is the embattled aging. I mean the aging process which requires constant challenging, constant suffering even, decline uh, and losses. The third one was mentioned here by other lecturers well, dementia molded aging. Uh, what can we say? Uh, in, age 20, in age 90 and above, one of, one, I mean, every second person is demented somehow. Uh, over the age 80, uh, every third person is demented. Well, this is a, a, a uh, William Uttermolen is an American painter. He uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer at the age of 61. And he made self-portraits throughout the years. Just follow the years and see what happened to him in this dementia. dementia. So there is a controversy whether dementia helps us to recover from the past trauma because our cognitive ability is so much lower, or whether on the other side or on the contrary, the dementia stirs up our past trauma because there are no inhibitions anymore to stop it. So we return to the main question. Do traumatic events over the life course impair mental health in older age? The answer, it may be. But, but, 
it depends on other variables, on other um, uh, mediators and moderators, where I, I gave you two examples of uh, psychological mechanisms, time perspective and meaning uh, uh, that may interfere. Uh, there are others. Uh, and uh, it depends on other factors, which makes it all uh, so much interesting to take aging, old age, as a paradigm, as a paradigm of the dialectics between resilience and vulnerability, the ability to, 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 to withstand so much decline and losses from the past, and still to be resilient and have a normal life and satis satisfactory life. So this is the dialectics of aging, actually. And I would like to end up uh, in uh, a citation of uh, Freida. Freida was a Dutch survivor, Holocaust survivors, uh, Jewish, uh, and uh, famous researchers of uh, emotions. Well, he said the emotional impact of traumatic events never really wanes. It can only be overwritten. Thank you. You are right. You are right, just in a few words. You are right. Israel is not high uh, in the suicide rate. Again, it belongs to the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean circles. In all, you know, all the Catholic uh, countries, even Greece, the Orthodox uh, uh, religion. Uh, well, uh, they are low, uh, low in suicide, whereas in Central and uh, and North Europe, it's higher, but their depression is lower. I mean, it's a, we uh, some argue argue that it's a matter of emotionality. I mean, where emotionality is high, depression is more expressed, like in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, uh, in Scandinavia, they don't like to talk about emotions. So, but still, it doesn't it doesn't mean that. Suicide is not there. So it's a complex thing, yeah. Yes? Is concussion accident or uh, abuse concussion uh, part of the traumatic uh, event? Concussion? Yes. Well, every uh, major health event that stops or interrupts the regular and the normal flow of life may be traumatic and in most cases is somewhat traumatic. So the answer is yes, it may be. So we are very, I, we are very careful. We call it potentially traumatic event, not necessarily traumatic. Yeah. 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 In order to, to measure the psychological impact, you need other measures, not the uh, biological ones. I mean, a, a fear, um, a, a, a tragedy, pain, a a certain other uh, measures that go otherwise, I mean, in, in, they are meaningful to one's perspective on one's life. The biological measures won't do it all. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that they survived 
the, the Holocaust, they wouldn't commit suicide. Yeah. Almost most of them, even though uh, the elderly, and that's the reason I'm here, actually, the elderly, they, they, it's a problem, and the whole Holocaust comes back, and they are there, like never before when they are functioning. Yeah. And, uh, so uh, the question is, what can you do, really? And I, I don't think you can answer here, but there is no real treatment that we can help these people. Teach them the mechanisms I mentioned. Teach them to use, there are others, I don't have time for that. Teach them to use proper psychological mechanisms. They may be helpful. Because usually you give them drugs. And that's, that's... Drugs won't do it all, that's what I answered. Yeah, exactly. Drugs won't do it all. But that's the problem, that's the way yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.